Hello, and welcome to this panel session on business-led solutions for Asia. Now, I know from the agenda, it's been a really busy day with a lot of sessions, a lot of fascinating insights, a lot of really high-level um, experienced speakers, and we are really excited to be part of this important discussion. Uh, I hope you're you're still tuning in after the busy after the busy day of sessions, but we really hope to be able to give you some great insights to take away with you for the evening. Um, if you are joining in Asia for the day, if you're in Europe, uh, we have an excellent lineup of speakers, which I'll present to you in just a moment. What we hope to uncover here is as we move into recovery mode, and clearly Asia is a bit further down that road than those of us joining from Europe or the UK or the US. But the private sector clearly has an important role to play in all of this. So we'll talk about what, what the businesses can do, how they can partner with the public sector, and what are the urgent priorities as we move into what we hope is a recovery phase for the world. Uh, so that's enough out of me. Let me tell you who we have with us, and I'll get them to introduce themselves a little more properly next. We have Noel Akpada. Um, I'm Apologies if I mispronounce any of the names of our esteemed speakers. Uh, Mateus Bosch, Payel Dalal, Kenison Bella Pulai, and Yona Welcome. Yona Welker, welcome to all of you, and thank you for making time to join us from your respective time zones very early in, in, in some cases and later in the evening for others. I'd like to ask each of you if you can just tell us a little bit about what you do um, so we understand about how your roles fit into our discussion and this recovery phase. And, and what are the headline thoughts that you have on our topic today? What should we be thinking about? I'll start with Payal. Oh, we've lost Payal. So we won't start with, we'll start with Mateus. Yes. Um, hello. Thank you very much. Very kind to kind of, uh, it's very interesting to kind of see this kind of Wonderful, a lot of people here now already joining. Yes, my name is Matthias Bosch. I'm working for um, Global Dignity. Global Dignity is an international nonprofit organization that was founded 2006 at the World Economic Forum by Prince Harkon and two other founders. One is um, Pekka Heimanen, a Finnish, uh, Finnish uh, philosopher. And the focus is on, on dignity. It's about teaching dignity and the concept of dignity. And so since 2006, we have now reached a level where we are in around 80 countries and we reach around one and a half million people, kids a year with this, with our teaching material. And um, we, we try to go into schools starting as early as five to 18 years old and have um, you know, appropriate to, to, to the age, various programs, seminars, and, um, and and project work in order to understand the concept of dignity and to live it. So it's about awareness, educating, and living dignity. And how can we apply? You're obviously working with children, but the topic of dignity is really important, and I know you're really involved in, in dealing with communication as well. Yes. What lessons can be applied to our grown-up business leaders? Yes, for the grown-up business leaders, they, they need dignity as, as, as much as anyone else. Um, as a little bit, uh, a kind of a nutshell situation is, especially now when we all communicate via Zoom and all these uh, little tiles on our screen, for us, it's important that we 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 convey the, the the concept of you have to see the human behind that person you are talking to. It's it's uh, now we have five different people from five different continents, but yet there's always a human behind it. And in order to understand what people are saying, how they communicate, it is worth take a step back and and, and realize this is a human being. It's it's not just a photograph or a tile you are talking towards. It is really a human being. And showing the dignity and the respect the person deserves, everyone deserves dignity. And 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 that is um, a little bit of um, a, you know a, a reset for our own behavior to realize this, and then start our communicating um, before we we start talking, realizing this is, these are humans we are talking to, and we need to kind of see them as a human being before we we interact. That's a little bit takeaway. 
That, that was a really important takeaway. I just want to say right now, I'm receiving a scary message that my internet is unstable. So in case the very worst happens and I briefly disappear, I want to ask you to just carry on with our discussion, but we'll hope not. This is the, the life we're living now, reliant on our technology. Um, Kenison, tell us a little bit about, about your work and, and what you think we should be thinking about at this moment in time. Yeah, hi, thank you. Good evening, uh, everybody from Malaysia. Um, I'm a corporate uh, person and currently now I'm the CEO of uh, US Art Bank International and they are a art investment group, uh, cross-border art investment group. And um, we own substantial amount of art and we are intending to, and we are already in the space of uh, making a marketplace uh, for art in uh, throughout Asia, Asia Pacific, and we intend to go to Europe. That's just a short, a short uh, introduction to us. Um, and what we are trying to do is also um, reach out. <clears throat> and as we talked before, is to reach out. Um, in our sector, we are reaching out to the marginalized artists, uh, people who cannot ac get access to markets. Uh, that's what we can do. And what are the areas that we can do in terms of finance, in terms of space, in terms of capacity? Now, my, my, my thoughts I want to share with you all is it's about, um, it's about sharing capacity. I think we're all sitting on excess capacity. We have excess capacity in terms of space. We have excess capacity in terms of uh, uh, people. We have excess capacity in terms of digital. A lot of, a lot of companies have so much of uh, digital capability, but they're only using 20%, 30%. Now, what we need to do, businesses need to do, is use this capacity and share. Let me take a simple example very quickly. I've got a, a building, say I've got a building and I have um, um, a big area where it was used to be a food court. But today, I don't, we don't have a food court anymore because the number of people coming to work is much less. And the operator has closed down and left. Why don't you share that free for a year with anybody who has been retrenched or let off work or somebody's loss of income? Take the space and run it. So I want people to think in that terms, in what can you do with your excess capacity, number one. Now, that doesn't need investment. It needs the word, and very much I like to think in Matthias' term, about giving dignity, is sharing your space. Let's go back to that, and let's not try and build new capacity. So including, for example, sharing of internet. Today, uh, society is so marginalized by the fact of access to internet, access to tourism. Now, a lot of companies have so much of bandwidth, but hey, you don't use it. It's wasted. Some of them use it at night, but in the daytime, can you share with a school? Can you share with a marginalized society that's living in, 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 in um, suburb, suburbs which are poor? So we need to get people to, of course, there's issues over security and all that. That's something we need to talk about, but I'm sure it can be done. So for me, it's about sharing capacity. And that's what the business has got to do to reach out. Thank you. And it draws a, you drew a nice link there with this issue of, of, of dignity and, and some of the ways that we can achieve that. You mentioned your work supporting marginalized artists, but of course there are many marginalized groups and societies around the world. What could business be doing to help be more inclusive and support marginalized groups across the board? Like I said, um, that's me, right? Sorry. Like Sorry, said, that's you. No. <laughs> like I said, the most important thing, like going out there today, we are seeing that people are cutting back on uh, purchases. People are cutting back on consumption. People are cutting back on 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 on, um, on on spending, and that that has a multiplier effect on the economy. Now we're not asking uh, we're not asking companies to spend a lot of money, but look at your spend and see how you can spread it around. Instead of giving the contract to one big company, can you give it to some smaller companies? Keep the SMEs alive. Then the SMEs keep the people down the lane alive. So number one is to save, save and secure the consumption so that life can go on at the lowest level. Let's not talk about people who sit in the comfort of office. We need to get out there and see what happens. So artists is one. I mean, look at all the performers, people who perform in clubs, people who do acting, plays, all of them have no income. Guy used to sing in a pub. He's, he's 
jobless, you know, there's no income at all. How can we now uh, reach out to him? Can we now look at ways to bring him into the education center? Because this thing, uh, can he perform and, and do uh, tutorials and tuitions online? How can we en- embrace this capacity, this capability? So reaching out, really, we are, we are, uh, the mid-level people are the ones who are trapped and then the bottom 40. So um, let's look at what we have and share the capacity and try and get really drilled down and just be beyond words. Drill down and how you can say, look, 20% of my capacity is going to go out to reach to the marginalized. And these are the society. Let's put that into the into the investment portfolio and say, look, this is what we have done. Make a report card out of it and say, look, that is why I'm I am I'm, I'm, I'm looking at long term as a business. So this is what we 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 we, we suggest. Thank you very much. And uh, Noel, tell us a little bit about uh, your work and what do you make of what you've heard so far and what, what else do you think we should be thinking about? Okay, thank you very much, Courtney. Um, I run a strategy and execution firm out of Nigeria and we consult to governments and private sector organizations on how to improve on their innovation strategy. But uh, we have particular focus in helping organizations design and implement a unique social impact proposition, uh, moving away from uh, regular scattershot corporate social responsibility initiatives that most of them usually embark upon. Um, so in a nutshell, that's what we do. And um, drilling down into the topic for today, I would say COVID-19 has exacerbated um, a lot of the inequalities we have been seeing in the world over a, over a long period of time now. Um, and I'll give a very, very brief example to explain um, what I'm talking about. A couple of weeks ago, I'm sure the whole world realized that there was um, a bit of unrest in Nigeria um, around the NSARS movement. Uh, it, was, it was a hashtag that trended on most social media platforms across the globe. Um, STARS is an arm of the police force and um, for a while now they have been dealing um, in a particular way with Nigerians, uh, reported cases of deaths, murders, injuries and all that. And the people rose up and said no, enough is enough, SARS must be disbanded. But one one critical thing I saw during during the, the period of unrest was that people started calling out private sector organizations to be part of what was going on. It was quite shocking for most of these organizations because they had never ever felt that they should be part of um, a movement involving the people. And after the unrests were over, which which, um, I'm sure we all realize a lot of destruction happened, especially in Lagos and Abuja, a particular bank froze the accounts of some of the NSARS leaders. And almost immediately, there was a hashtag that was created for people to close their accounts in that bank. The ripple effect was so terrible, the officials of the bank had to come out on the media to apologize to the entire nation on what they had just done. So that made me realize something. Responsible consumerism is on the increase even as we speak right now. And um, a pandemic situation further makes it more critical because People now want to understand how brands can play further roles in their lives outside core functional responsibilities, outside their core functional products and services. They want to see brands play more engaging roles in their life from a social and, and, and a social and emotional and economic and health perspective. So basically, um, talking from an Asian perspective now, I, I would love to see that increased participation of businesses in the lives of people outside their core functional responsibilities. And how can companies avoid, how can they sort of get get involved with this responsible um, consumerism and, and take the right stance on important issues without being caught in the middle of, let's say, political disputes? So if you take the example in the US, a lot of brands, companies get criticized because they donated to the Trump campaign. And so you make half the country mad, you make half the country (laughs) happy. Um, When it's not a very clear cut case or it's divisive, how could companies navigate that? Well, I I think 
and this has been the problem for a lot of organizations. Um, they see corporate social responsibility and corporate social investment as an add-on rather than a foundational principle that should guide the direction of, an, of, of, of any organization. So what my organization tries to do is to drill down into the hearts of the leadership of these organizations to make them understand that your engagement with society, which goes beyond your core functional products, um, has to come from within. It has to be driven. It has to be a top-down approach, whereby leadership understands that this is where we want to go. This is how we like the, our products to engage with society. This is how we like our brand to engage with the environment. This is how we like our brand to engage with the climate. You know, and 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 all of the um, 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 issues that could be affecting the consumer outside the primary product or service. And once that is designed, once that is agreed upon. The organization aggressively, starting from you know, starting from immediately, because right now things are getting worse and consumers are getting to question brands more and more on a day-to-day -day basis. So brands have to now aggressively champion these courses, whereby they engage society and allow society to understand what they stand for from a socioeconomic perspective and how they want to engage society. And I, and I don't think that problem would arise, especially if brands try to avoid a lot of the sensitive areas, like you said, politics, um, aligning with certain um, um, kinds of um, issues that society may not be totally embraced you know, um, um, on. I, I think it will be easier for brands to navigate uh, the issue that way. But whenever a brand, like you said, tries to align itself with sensitive issues, of course they're going to have problems. But I can tell you that there are a lot of non-sensitive issues that the world cares about, and brands can find a way around aligning their 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 unique social impact propositions around those non-sensitive issues. Thank you. And, and Jana, you're working in, in the technology space, which is obviously a, a connector of all these topics we're talking about. And, and is very central to the ways that we work now. Um, what's your reaction to some of the themes that your colleagues here have mentioned? Tell us about your very interesting work dealing with ethical technology and, and AI and a lot of central topics here. And what should we be thinking about when we navigate the, the kind of new technology space? Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to talk uh, today because I started my journey uh, in Asian region and surprisingly nowadays my mission uh, circled uh, to this region. Um, my work is focused on inclusive technology research and venture capital and one of the key exploration I've made uh, over my journey is uh, really difficult to solve these uh, issues and challenges we face without very complex work so I try to solve it through at least six, seven levels. On one hand, I'm working on foundation, which will back the future research related to neurodiversity. Um, uh, on the other level, I'm involved in technology, collecting portfolios of uh, early stage uh, startups and companies uh, on the three directions. First is the future of learning and work. Second is the future of uh, diversity. And the last one uh, focused on the circular economy and sustainable uh, products. Um, at the same time, I'm trying to be very proactive uh, working with these existing ecosystems. Uh, in particular, I'm an entrepreneur in residence in 500 startups. So along with my own work, I'm trying to uh, actually uh, share the message uh, with the, the biggest uh, actors of the of venture capital in terms of uh, uh, more proactivity, in terms of inclusive technology, adaptive learning, social robotics. And I'm also an entrepreneur in residence in INSEED uh, in Singapore. Uh, beside that, um, I obviously realize that we're not able just to create technology uh, completely ignoring ethical things. So I'm involved in projects related to AI and data ethics. Uh, one of the recent ones is a uh, uh, all tech is human uh, is a U New York based uh, community is a data ethics for all. And recently I joined a community uh, called Montreal AI Ethics uh, Institute. So our goal is to not only create technology, but push uh, startups, 
companies and unicorns like Amazon, Google, Microsoft use data, artificial intelligence, computer vision, facial recognition, specifically when we're talking about uh, people of color, women, minorities, in ethical way, thinking about criteria behind it. Um, and the last levels uh, focus on talent. I believe that young generation is always a promise for us and there's always a potential uh, to uh, update existing mechanism and organism. So almost every weekend I spend co-creating hackathons what's what I call the zero level of technology. Just uh, yesterday, I spent my time in Lebanon. Before that, uh, it was places uh, located in South Asia, before that, Middle East. Uh, the next uh, weeks dedicated to Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Israel. So my goal is to find the people who are already focused on research in well-being, learning, mental health, disability. There are many, many people who currently have no access to technology, but they already have a, a research uh, theoretical um, knowledge. So we just able to pick these people and put them to correct funnel of a venture capital technology university to connect them with places like MIT, Harvard, Oxford, uh, and so on. And the last level uh, is a lecturing. Um, I'm trying uh, to lead this discussion. So I've created a pretty significant lecture tour dedicated to what I call algorithmic, diver uh, algorithmic diversity. It's basically a approach behind more ethical and smarter way to build a technology like social robots, AI. And I try to uh, actively push this idea in different ecosystems. So in terms of today discussions, uh, I believe Asia is a specific uh, place, no matter we're talking about Singapore, Hong Kong, or South Asia, places like uh, India. Uh, because on one hand, Asian region is a source uh, of uh, just an enormous potential in terms of technology and talent. Just recently, I spent a hackathon with MIT, and 70% of the people were from Asian, places like India, where... Even though we're limited in terms of resources, these people think about of a global mental health problem, about the depression uh, that currently one of the, uh, the number one reason of disability in the world, both uh, on the level of families, but also workplaces. And these people would love to create it. And it's an amazing opportunity to empower this talent. Uh, at the same time, if we go to Hong Kong or Singapore and universities like NUS or business schools like INSEED, these people involved in hardware, which what currently, for instance, U.S. actually lacks. Most of the startups in U.S. are mostly focused on software, but at the same time, Asian region much more involved in robotics. So is a foundation of an actual mm -hmm. revolution in this field. And that's what we're proactively uh, making through bridges between the regions. Um, and it's about good things, but about bad things. Unfortunately, the gap in terms of uh, inclusion is still huge. 90% of the people with autism are not employed full time. Only one, uh, one person from 10 uh, have uh, access to inclusive technology. I mean, people with disabilities. So at the same time, with people uh, is an extreme source of talent in our economy. And I really have a hope which Asian region have a potential to connect these dots. Talent, technology, capital, and challenges we have currently uh, both in, region, in Asian region, but also globally in US, in UK, across the Europe. And what we're doing is uh, bridges. So over... Today conversation, I really would love to um, bring attention what we already have, because Microsoft and Amazon, they're working on accessibility programs for disabled people. Google worked on Google Glass for people with autism. Tech companies already work on neurodiverse platforms uh, to hire people with different types of neurodiversity. Uh, we already have uh, adaptive robotics for people with ADHD. We already have a collaborative learning platforms and classes in universities, and we have AI training for dyslexia people in classes. So now our goal is to connect the dots. And 
which is why I'm today here. Thank you very much. And you picked up on some of the themes um, that your colleagues discussed, um, such as being inclusive. And I think also we are touching on issues of dignity as well. Um, one of the things that Noel spoke about is, of course, about companies and how they can, I guess, be on the right side of history, as it were. Um, technology companies get a, quite a lot of criticism, and then there are, I guess, controversies over use of data and the role even that they've had to play in, in some uh, populist and unsavory uh, political movements. What do you think tech companies could do um, to play a more productive role in leading us into recovery, apart from um, being sort of good citizens in the way that you that you discussed, and uh, yes. in particular in Asia. Sorry. Uh, yes. Um, uh, first of all, it's a, it's a very good question, and I just uh, discussed it a few days ago. Uh, first of all, uh, we actually need to eliminate. Uh, a political element uh, from this discussion. Uh, almost on every level working on inclusion, we try to uh, be focused on a uh, practical vision on uh, inclusion in terms of uh, how we see, what ki kind of problem we would love to, uh, to solve, what is driven by political agenda or actual problem we have, because it's, a ver it's much more complex than they typically see on uh, on our social networks or in a television. We need to create solution for women, people of color, neurodiverse people, disabled people. The problem is much, much bigger. So on one hand, we need to completely eliminate uh, political agenda for uh, for technology. Uh, second level, we actually lack the competition in technology field. We have a, a unicorns like uh, uh, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, who have a, some particular vision of accessibility. And it's a good, they were a pioneers of inclusive design, but we uh, still lack of a significant amount of a companies who are actually involved in this field to create a competition and different vision of this agenda. And for instance, when I talk to people who work on social robots, but for autistic kids, they say, we don't consider other companies in this field as a competitors because the whole market is empty. It's almost don't exist. We need much more companies working on this problem. So uh, we actually need the competition to create a diverse vision of inclusion because currently it's uh, almost the same as ever political is ever dr driven by uh, very few uh, technology companies. And the last one uh, is a social science and ethics component. Uh, uh, last years, we actually work and proactively work on the a new type of a professionals integrated in companies. And that's what we actually have done with all tech as human. The, the main idea is to incorporate the uh, professionals related to social science and ethics in different kinds of companies, not only unicorns, but small businesses, in order to create criteria behind the technology and control how actively it works uh, and how uh, is equal, how we are um, able to avoid biases, uh, and so on. And the last level is the policies. Um, I'm involved in projects driven by European Commission, and I believe it, it can be done in the Asia as well. Almost every time when I judge startups related to uh, AI, I have a criteria related to ethical consideration. Moreover, I'm reached by organizers about how ethical companies works. For instance, I'm, I'm judge and mentor company related to dyslexia in AI training. And organizers ask me how ethical this company works. I mean, it's about actual uh, po po um, policy in public control. And it's another level would help uh, to make companies more responsible. So it's uh, about at least four level, very complex work. Thank you, very complex indeed. And here I'd like to return to Mateus, because um, of course there's what companies do and then there's what they say. And in terms of the, the leadership, um, we spoke a little bit about the, the importance of communication. If you were offering, if I'm the CEO of, a, of a, an important company, um, in Asia or anywhere, and I'm I'm trying to rally my troops, as it were, um, and encourage the workforce at, at this difficult time of of turmoil and transition. What should I be thinking about in terms of how I communicate as I lead my company out of out of this crisis? 
I don't have a real kind of uh, easy applicable rule here, but what we do and what we try to help companies is um we we develop an, an ambassador program which we which means we go into companies we um we teach those company employees um our concepts and then use them as facilitators and multiplicators going into schools and so that we have um that they really understand first what what dignity means and then and are using that knowledge and going into schools going into um facilities where where kids are orphanages whatever it is in order to kind of teach them that concept because we understand that once you learn something and you have to turn kind of teach it someone else it really kind of is a, is a much deeper knowledge at your end and you will live it then in a different way than simply kind of taking it in and then kind of go your own way you need to kind of use that knowledge and also teach it to somebody else and that has a ripple effect in a kind of almost like an avalanche effect you are kind of you, you teach 10 10 educators in a, in a in a in a company which then also understands this is an important knowledge that we want to use for our leadership leading with dignity and then we take this knowledge and bring it into schools bring it into other facilities where you are then empowering people especially in asia where you have gender equality issues empowering girls going to schools and kind of make that kind of a real topic is somehow good for the entire society you know those kind of elements that that you know dignity applies to everyone it's not just the few of them everyone has dignity and and um so it it's it's a, it's a complex approach i mean when you go to our website you will find all these teaching material free and it goes of course according to the age groups in the different stages but uh, cyber cyber mobbing and those kind of things is a big issue these days and so that also needs to be taught either in school or in companies and then also kind of brought down into these various um uh, kind of target groups let's say schools facilities where kids are and um and and then we believe that this will come back also as a concept and understanding that you have a different communication um policy in the company how you communicate with each other as i said that you see the human behind it especially when you have multi ethnical groups or, or teams these are things but i see pal is now on i think we should kind of leave over to her you were gone yes, for I, quite a while. well well it yeah, was Oh thank you. I could hear and see all of you. So I've been here the whole time. For some oh, reason good. my video um my video um it wasn't wasn't showing so so folks couldn't tell I was here. So I did hear everyone speak. Um and you know apologies for the for the internet connectivity, but I do think it it is fortuitous that I'm going last because I think there's real opportunity here to weave all of the different comments and themes that we've heard. Um you know with Kenison talking about the need to share capacity city and the need to support small business matthias and his dignity at mastercard we call it the decency quotient um with noah talking about a uh, noel talking about corporate responsibility and the roles corporates have in in um shaping purpose and really driving purpose and of course a lot of what um Uh Yona was talking about around inclusion. So I look after um social impact for Mastercard for international markets. So that's everything outside of the US and Canada. Um and as we're thinking about economic recovery, um you know, my my real focus here is how we're supporting small business with the with a the theme around inclusive digitization, right? We know small businesses are the backbone of local economies. We know that they're really hurting given the pandemic. Um, um you know the latest statistics i've seen and these are before the second wave of lockdowns was that somewhere between 40 and 70% of small businesses are at risk of failing that has massive consequence not only in terms of consumption but jobs as well and so how do you help small business and i think one of the challenges we've seen and one of the opportunities we've seen with the pandemic is that we've seen a mass acceleration of digital but there was always a digital divide and to snowell's point what the pandemic has really done is exacerbated inequalities and that's especially true when it comes to digital inequality right those who have access to digital who have access to data were able to weather the pandemic and have been able to survive those who haven't have been farther left behind and so what i'm really focused on and what mastercard's really focused on is how can we bring to bear all of the assets of the company how can we bring all of our networks all of our partners 
partners together to really think about the financial security and the financial resiliency of small business using digital as the main theme. And of course, to Matthias's point, this has to be done with, with decency and with dignity at the core because, you know, this is about commercially sustainable social impact. This isn't, this isn't just, you know, to Noel's point, this isn't just kind of side of desk, right? You have to make this core to the business. You have to integrate it. And so what we're really thinking about is how we bring a global strategy that brings to bear all of the assets of MasterCard to really support small businesses and how we really catalyze all of our partners to do so. Um, and I think, you know, what's really exciting about this conversation is Asia is far ahead when it comes to where it is on the trajectory of the pandemic, right? They've, you know, we, we've gone from, um, mass rates of infection to, you know, the economy is really stabilizing here in, in Asia. And so Asia has a real opportunity here to lead um, and to kind of set the standard and the approach when it comes to economic recovery. Um, you know, one last thing I'll just say is, you know, we saw this when it came to kind of my, the microfinance sector, where Asia went first in terms of trying to figure out how to stabilize its microfinance institutions, how to digitize quickly, how to modernize quickly. And then they were able, Asian MF MFIs were able to talk to Latin American MFIs and African MFIs to say, here are the lessons we learned. And, you know, here's here's how to leapfrog in your journey based on what we've done. And so I think there's real opportunity here for Asia to not only lead the recovery, but lead from an inclusive perspective. And thank you for that. And, and glad you're um, glad you heard the discussion and are able to comment on on all of these important topics your colleagues raised. Are there examples you could point to maybe in particular in various places in Asia of, of where such lessons are being applied? I know, for example, you do some interesting work in Bangladesh um, with. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that we have been doing at MasterCard is thinking about how you really foster and champion inclusive digitization and how you use inclusive digitization and digitization itself as a tool for empowerment, as a tool for financial security, a tool for resiliency. So one of the things that we have been doing is looking at how you digitize supply chains, right, as a, as a mechanism to drive financial inclusion. So in the garment space, we have worked in Cambodia, Bangladesh, and Egypt um, to, to digitize the wages of garment workers. And we learned a lot about the fact that you can't just digitize wages, you have to do a whole set of activities around the ecosystem to create that enabling environment, especially given that garment workers are 80% female. There are a lot of social culture, gender-based violence implications. So you have to think about driving digital literacy, financial literacy, financial management, but also thinking about how you give the women the tools to have the conversations with their fathers, their brothers, their husbands about their own financial agency. Now, when the pandemic happened, of course, um, garment factories shut down. But what was really positive is because we had digitized and worked with garment brands to digitize wages, garment workers were still being paid. And then what happened was that government started to use digital disbursements to help support workers. And so a lot of the lessons that we learned in the toolkits and the assets we created could then be used by governments for for their own digital disbursement programs. Um, and so, you know, it, again, great example of how Cambodia and Bangladesh decided, you know what, we're going to really champion the idea of social disbursements now need to be digital because of social distancing issues. And we at MasterCard were able to, along with our partners, BSR, say, well, here's a whole set of tools, videos, and things to make sure that adoption is is driven as high as possible. Thank you very much. And I'd like to return to Kennison because you are um, based in, you are a panelist actually based in Asia. Um, and of course, it's a very big and diverse region, so we can't really treat it as a monolith. But are there particular uh, places we should be keeping an eye on there, uh, again, as we, as we look to shape the post-COVID world and any positive examples you see? Uh yeah, I think uh, most of the Asian countries have done well in the sense they got a grip of the issues fast. Um, particularly if you look at Vietnam, Vietnam's recovery is uh, tremendous. You know, I mean, the sheer energy of the people, but also the um, when we had the Horasis in, in Vietnam, uh, 
two years ago. In fact, the last last year was also in Vietnam. You know, digitization and digital uh, applications were the forefront of the government and the people. I mean, the coding, um, they were fantastic coders. They were driving technology and was very inclusive of the SMEs. So if you if you if you if you go down to uh, Vietnam or uh, Cambodia, if you go to a small coffee shop by the roadside, you can get free Wi-Fi. That's how inclusive you, you sit in a coffee shop, small size coffee shop, you get free. I, I don't see that in some of the bigger, uh, more modern economies in in Asia. So you saw that this sort of embrace the. The, the breaking of the digital divide by saying, no, we're going to make it access, we're going to make it cheap, we're going to make So sharing cap capacity is also making it that, making it affordable. Uh, today, we are all working from school, uh, working from home, studying from, uh, and studying at home. But immediately, the digital divide has gone deeper. You know, you, the lack of data, the lack of uh, more, uh, uh, access, immediately. So companies have to step up. You know, because this is your consumer. It's your future consumer. And if your consumer doesn't grow, your business is going to be stagnant. Simple as that. So you got to reach out and say, look, okay, I got this capacity. I got this data center. I'm using 40%, 60% here. Let's, somebody should drive this moment. And I'm talking to people to say, hey, let's all get together. And they try to have a movement using AI using AI and say, how can I disperse this excess capacity? How can it make it easy? Can I use the blockchain? Can I? So inclusiveness means a lot more than just saying, hey, you are welcome to do some space. You're welcome to do that. Reach out, touch the people and say, how can I make your day go further? Make your month go further, your week. You know? So for us, for example, we, we, we have adapted uh, uh, young budding artists who are struggling, and 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 we sort of take all their pieces and say, okay, fine, don't worry about it for the next three months. You know, we are so we have taken some, and we are looking for more, uh, and we are trying to make a marketplace accessible. Now that's the little that we can do, but there's much more we can do. So we are trying to reach out to other organizations like minded to see how we can escalate this, create a snowball movement. Maybe across all the places that we are talking about. MasterCard is started rolling. They've got the capacity. They're sharing the capacity. That's an ideal thing about sharing capacity. People must step forward. Organizations must step forward and say, look, for me, a telco in this country, a telco in any country sits on excess capacity. And it's a burnt. It's, if you don't use it today, it's burnt. So you know every day you've got 20% 20, 20 excess capacity. Disperse it. Give it away. Create a new consumer, bring them back, resuscitate them. And that needs to be very driven by, by really the top leadership and the thinking capacity of, of, of the, the different thinking capacity of giving back dignity. To, the dignity belongs to everybody. And I, I, I'm so uh, excited by this because access, the digital divide takes away uh, dignity of person. So, it's a dignity story, I, kind of thing. Absolutely. That's a dignity story, what you're doing. If you are having kind of an excess capacity and you give it to people who don't have it, brilliant. That's a real good kind of empowering people who don't, don't have the possibility. And now all of a sudden they have access to the world. Yeah. That's a yeah. great story. And, yeah. Indeed. We need to do that. We need to move it. Thoughts here. We have only about two minutes left, but I want to ask Noel, I see you. Uh, nodding along to some of what's being said, uh, can we have your your reaction and how well can these um, issues and lessons be applied in Africa, for example, where you're joining us from? Yeah, um, just like everyone has said, companies need to understand what is actually going on right now and um, the, the, the level of um, um, education that the consumer you know currently has and is currently exposed to. A study was done by Nielsen, um, about 30,000 people, and it was found out that 55% of, of that population would rather buy from a responsible brand. And 
it was also found out that 60% of that population, you know, in, in question would rather work for an, for, for an organization that has a clearly defined unique social impact strategy. Now, now, what this means is that companies need to understand what is going on. Consumers are getting more responsible. Consumers want to buy from responsible brands. Consumers now care about um, other issues aside from just what the company is offering as a product or a service. They want to know that, the, the, that this company cares about them at a deeper level. And companies need to understand what is going on and find a way to scope and and gather information about what the consumer is currently thinking, especially within a pandemic situation that the globe is currently being faced with. Companies need to understand. They need to know. Many of them do not know. They act like they know, but they have no idea what is happening. And companies that take advantage of this information and engage with consumers on a deeper level and actually show consumers how they're impacting society, um, I, I, I I heard about um, certain brands actually putting um, uh, uh, write-ups of, of their social impact strategy within their product packaging to let the mm-hmm. to let consumers understand. Yes, you are buying this product, but this is how we're also impacting society, and this is why you should keep buying from us. So, so yeah. we're getting to a state where unique social impact propositions now becomes a competitive strategy of of organizations going forward, rather than just what the what the what the product or the service offers. So, I think this is what yeah. what what organizations need to be thinking right now um, in Africa. Based on the, st- the study I just cited, Africa had the lowest um, when it comes to social responsibility consciousness. Um, Asia Pacific had the highest, about sixty percent, followed by the U.S. and 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 all that. So Africa is still is still coming up, and and we where, know the challenges they, um, education thank, and all that. I'll, I'll stop here. Yeah. Thank you. No, it's it's a it's a, it's a topic I wish we could go more into. Um, but but thank you for ending us on this important note and making the business case for the corporate social responsibility. And I think where you were going there at the end is Africa still has a ways to go on this metric, but it's good there are these examples. Asia probably further along, um, perhaps gives a. Uh, I guess, a pathway there. I want to say thank you very much. I wish we had more time. I'd like to come back to Yona to talk a bit more of AI. The time goes way too fast. Um, you all brought really unique and quite disparate perspectives uh, to the conversation, but I think a lot of um, key themes here to to get people thinking about as we as we hopefully move into recovery. So thank you for, for making the time to join us. Um, thank you to our audience uh, for watching us. Thank you uh, to Her- Horasis uh, for having us for this discussion. I hope everybody, wherever you are, stays safe and, and well, and we'll see you at a future gathering, either virtually or in person next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very Thank you. Very Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.